All right, this morning we're going to talk about repentance. Now, there's a big argument right now online, and I'm sure other places too, but they, a lot of people are saying, I've been contacted now a couple times, and they say, what do you believe in, lordship salvation or easy believism? And I say, neither. You know, and, and people, well, what do you mean? You have to be either one or the other. No, you don't. Okay, they're both heretical, and I'm going to talk about that today. And what's happening is, Lordship salvation is wrong, but these people that believe that you just pray a prayer and that's it, what they're doing is they're constantly adding more and more and more to the definition of Lordship salvation. And just this week, I was, you know, sent a message and then I clicked on some other links there and there's, there's a guy, he's a pastor, and he was preaching that uh, the Romans road to salvation is actually works salvation and it's a false gospel i mean that's how bad these some of this stuff is getting online and they'll say that there's no repentance connected with salvation so that's all i want to talk about that this morning here about repentance and the true gospel uh now to start out i just want to say this thing of lordship salvation you have to be careful when you start hearing these titles for things and you have to look it up in the bible Okay, and the fact is there is no such thing as lordship salvation in the Bible. Lordship only, that word only appears twice, Mark 10.42 and Luke 22.25, and both times it talks about the Gentiles exercising lordship over people. Okay, it's never a reference to salvation. But the definition of lordship salvation is kind of hard to nail right down because there's a lot of people that teach different things about it, so... You know, you might get one guy that teaches this type of lordship salvation, another guy that does this, or something different, slightly different. But basically, lordship salvation is that at salvation you come to God as a sinner, and also and and you're saved from sins, but then you stop sinning. You make Jesus the Lord of your life, and you never sin again after that. And there's people that teach this, and particularly among the Calvinists. They're very big on this whole thing of lordship salvation. Now, it doesn't work for two reasons. Okay, Reason number one is the sinful flesh is not eradicated at salvation. Okay, Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25 are probably some of the best verses to refute that. You still have a sinful body of flesh at salvation. And number two, there are carnal Christians. Okay? There are Christians that struggle with sin. And they're carnal. They're worldly. Okay? That doesn't mean that they're not saved. It just means that they're struggling with sin. So to teach that Jesus has to become... I mean, Jesus becomes your Lord at salvation. But this thing of Lordship salvation where He's your Lord and you never sin again. Well, no. That's not right. Okay, uh, and a, you know there are some groups that that uh, like the Nazarenes. They teach that uh, the old man is eradicated at the second work of grace. They'll say, you know, and they they believe that they don't sin. And if you do sin, well, then you really didn't get saved, and you got to get saved again. And you know, it's just a bunch of nonsense. Um, and of course, First John one uh, eight through ten is. Very, you know, you can use that to disprove this thing of saying that that uh, we have no sin in us. You know, the Bible says, if let me just read it quick here. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. You are a sinner as a Christian. Okay, don't fall for this thing of I don't sin anymore. Yes, you do. But what about easy believism? Easy believism is basically a teaching that you pray a prayer and there's no repentance, there's no mention of sin even. I mean, I heard something this week, I couldn't believe this, this guy that calls himself a preacher and he's just a wicked false prophet, he actually said that he goes out with candy and he'll go up to little kids and he'll say, do you want a piece of candy? Well, you know, what child is not going to say yes to that? And he'll say, okay, pray this prayer. And he'll, Jesus, I believe in you and I receive you. Okay, here's your candy. And I can guarantee you that guy goes back and brags, I led 300 
people to the Lord this weekend. No, you didn't. You led 300 people in a false prayer and gave them candy. <laughs> you know, and that's what a lot of these people are doing. And if you say they have to repent, oh, that's a false gospel. That's works-based salvation. See, it, it's just really, really, really bad. Uh, and like I said earlier, they're always adding things to what's called Lordship Salvation. And if you say anything about repentance, anything about sin, they'll say, that's Lordship Salvation. No, it isn't. And I'm going to show you that today. But the first thing that they have a problem with, the easy believism crowd, and by the way, Rick Warren, you can look at his book, 40 Days of Purpose, and his prayer of salvation in there is, Jesus, I believe in you and I receive you. Amen. That's it. Okay. Uh, kind of a weird thing to say that the Holy Spirit leads people to take an easier view of sin. Uh, he doesn't. But the first problem that they have is repentance. Okay, they'll say, and, and what they do, again, this false prophet, he said, the word repentance does not appear in the book of John. And he's right. He's right. It doesn't appear in the book of John, but it's every, it's all over the place in other books of the Bible. You know, and you know, you're supposed to just ignore the rest of Scripture because it doesn't appear in the book of John, which is ridiculous. So we're going to start out this morning in Matthew chapter 9. And we're going to see about this thing of repentance. What is repentance? What's the purpose of it? Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 through 13. It says here, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many public and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. They came to Jesus. Okay? Jesus didn't go hang out, you know, in the bars and things where they were at. Verse 11, And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They say, oh, well, there's no, you know, sinners aren't supposed to repent and stuff. That's a false gospel. Then why does Jesus Christ say that? That he came to call sinners to repentance. Now, there's the same thing over in Mark chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Luke Chapter 5, verses 29 through 32. It's a similar account of what happened there. But we're going to go next to Luke chapter 15. If you want to read the other accounts, you can do that there in uh, Mark and Luke. Luke chapter 15, verse 7. It says here, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. So again, you see that a sinner is supposed to repent and they are capable of repenting. Okay, they, I'm getting, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but another thing that they say is that sinners can't repent. They, they can't have a knowledge of sin. Yes, they can. And we're going to see that in just a little bit too. Now, People can say, you know, and I know the hyper dispensationalists like to do this. They'll say, well, that's back in the Gospels. That's, you know, before the our current Gospel was revealed to Paul. And, you know, that's not church age doctrine. This is in the Gospels. But what about that? Go to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at the first time that it appears after the crucifixion. Because, it, you know, those passages I read there are pre-crucifixion. So they could say, well, that doesn't, you know, we don't have to follow the repentance thing then. But that's not true. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It says here, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, the Church of Christ bases their whole system on that verse. And there are a couple others that do too. And you can't do that. Because, see, the book of Acts is a transitional book. So, what they were doing there, baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ, that's not the gospel that we preach today. Okay, the gospel we preach today is 1 Corinthians 15. You can see the thing, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, for the remission of sins. 
Um, but the point is there, he says repent to those people. So it does appear after the crucifixion. Go next, go next excuse me, to Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says here, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Repent and be converted. Okay? And you say, well then that's two different things. No. it's two. You could say it's two things, but it's, it's one event. Okay, we're going to see that as we continue here. Acts chapter 5 verse 31. Okay, it says here, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance to Israel. Okay, Acts chapter 11. Just going to hit a couple verses here. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. Okay, it says here, When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Granted repentance. So it came to Israel first in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 2, they're preaching to Jews. Um, but then it also went to the Gentiles. And God's granting repentance to them. Acts chapter 17 Go to Acts chapter 17. We're not going to look at all the references to repentance, by the way. Um, there are plenty of them, but we're not going to go through all of them. But Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Paul here in Acts chapter 17 is talking to Gentiles, people that are heathen, essentially. And verse 30, it says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So if you're one of these easy believism people that says that repentance is not tied to salvation, what do you do with these verses? It's there. It's right there. Uh, 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So Calvinism doesn't work either, by the way. But the point is, everybody should come to repentance. Okay? We're going to go one more place and then I'm going to tell you what the definition of the word repentance is. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Okay, Acts chapter 20, verse 21 says, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. See, there's two different things there. But it's one event. It's not that you repent of all your sins and you get all your sins taken care of and then you get saved. No, that isn't it. It's, what is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. Okay? Which creates a change in direction, by the way. You don't have a change of mind and continue doing what you're doing. Okay? A lost person... The way that they view their sin is, it's no big deal. I'm getting away with it. It's no big deal. But when they realize, when they come and they see from the scriptures, somebody you know presents the gospel to them and they say, you're a sinner. The Bible says that, that all of sin and come short of the glory of God. You know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You come and you realize, hey, I'm sinning. And it's not that my sin is just, it's up to me. No, you're sinning against God. So the change that has to happen there is you have to change your attitude towards sin. You have to change your mind about it. Okay, You have to say, hey, this sin is affecting my relationship with my creator. I'm in serious trouble here. And it's at that point that you say, okay, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And that's where faith in Jesus Christ comes in. Now, that's not works. That's not, you know, 
uh, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. The works that are condemned in the Bible are doing good deeds and things like that. It's not repentance of sin. That's not a work. Okay, that's just, I mean, you come to God as a sinner. All right, and if you don't come to God as a sinner, I'm sorry, you're not going to be saved. Just as simple as that. But they say, yes, but a lost man can't understand that they're a sinner. That's another thing that you'll hear. Well, I'm going to show you that that doesn't work. Turn back to Rome, or turn, actually, going this way, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 14. I'm going to show you that, in fact, the lost can understand that they are sinners. It says here, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. There's nobody out there that's born that doesn't have a guilty feeling when they lie or when they steal or, you know, you go back through the Ten Commandments, those laws are written in your heart, okay? And what this modern movement of today is all about, you know, they say, well, we're, we're moving forward, we're moving ahead. It's all about killing your conscience and destroying your conscience and so that you don't have that feeling of I'm sinning against God here. That's what the modern movement is. The whole hippie movement back in the 1960s, it was all about going against uh, the way that the Lord did things. So the fact of the matter is, God's laws are written in the heart of man. And this whole modern movement about we're more enlightened and everything, no, it's just that you've killed your conscience more. So go to Galatians chapter 3. We'll go there next. Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. Now we're going to see the purpose of the law here. Why uh, God's laws are written in the heart of men. Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus." Watch out for anybody who tries to get you to be saved by the law. Okay? You are to be convicted of your sins by the law, but trying to keep the law, you can never do it. And so what's going to happen is you'll end up going to hell if you're trying to keep the Ten Commandments in order to be saved. <clears throat> the purpose of the law is not for salvation. It's for conviction. It's to bring you to a point of repentance, and then your faith is in Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what it's there for. Romans chapter 7 verse 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. The purpose of the law is to bring conviction of sin. It's not for you to get saved. And there again, there's a lot of people that are trying to take people back under the Ten Commandments today. They're trying to go back. You have to keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. No, you don't. It's for conviction of sin. That's what the purpose of it is. Okay, but now I want to uh, show you some interesting things here. Go back to Genesis chapter 12. Again, with this thing of, you know, well, the lost, they can't understand that they're sinners. Well, I'm going to disprove that. Genesis chapter 12. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 10 through 20, uh, you have Abram and Sarai. This is before he was called Abraham, before she was called Sarah. And they are traveling through Egypt, and Abram says to Sarai, his wife, he says, you're fair, 
I'm worried that they're going to kill me and take you, so I'm just going to say that you're my sister. And so when we, you know, get before Pharaoh, and that's what he does. He comes in and he says, you know, here's my pretty sister. And Pharaoh says, okay, now she's going to be one of my wives, and he takes her into his house. Look at verse 17. Well, verse 16 there, you have Abram. Pharaoh gives him all kinds of nice stuff. But at verse 17, it says, And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Now look at verse 18. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to my wife. Now therefore behold thy wife, take her, and go thy way. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. Why was a heathen man like Pharaoh worried about messing around with another man's wife? See? Abram broke two of the Ten Commandments there. Number one, he almost caused a man to commit adultery. And number two, he lied. He bore false witness. He came in and he said, this is my sister. That was a lie. And Pharaoh rebuked him. Now, you know the interesting thing about this? The Ten Commandments weren't given yet. They weren't given to Moses yet. So you have a lost man that has two of the Ten Commandments that he's rebuking a man, you know, Abram. He's saying, you almost caused me to commit adultery and you bore false witness. Yeah, the lost world can know what's right and what's wrong. Yes, they can. I mean, why do you think people don't want to get saved? Why do you think the average person doesn't want to get saved? Is it just because they're walking around ignorantly? I've never heard of Jesus. No. They understand that it's connected with sin and that there's a need for repentance there. There's a need to change their mind on the issue of sin. Okay, now go back to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. And like I said, I, I actually heard this week that some guy was saying that the Romans' road to salvation is works. Works-based salvation, it's a false gospel. Just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, but that's how people, they're getting that bad. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. It's right there. You're not going to keep the Ten Commandments. Okay? This whole thing of, well, you know, you have to keep the commandments. Jesus said to keep my commandments, you know, and, and yeah, he didn't say that to be saved. Okay? Anybody who tells you that, they're lying to you. They're actually damning somebody when they say you have to keep the commandments to be saved because you can't. Okay? By the law is the knowledge of sin. All right? It's right there. Romans 3.23, very familiar one if you know your Bible. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody's a sinner. Okay, Romans 3.28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, as I've been covering here, the law is there. It's There's nobody that can say, I didn't know. I didn't know it was wrong to steal. I didn't know it was wrong to, to kill. I didn't know it was wrong to lie. No, you can't do that. That that law is there. But it's to bring you to a point of repentance where you say, hey, I'm sinning against God here. I need to change my mind. I need to change my direction here. And I'm a sinner. My self-righteousness, my good works, I can't live by the law. I can't keep the law to be saved. So... What am I going to do? Well, I'm repenting of that. I'm changing direction. And now I'm going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Okay? There's no good works associated with that. I mean, it's it's just right there. And this and this has been preached for, for a long, long time, for centuries. But, you know, it's just there. I, I don't know, know what more I can say to some of these easy believism people. Okay, uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And 
You know, salvation today is you come to God as a sinner, condemned by the law, and you put your faith in Jesus Christ as the only payment for your sins. That, I mean, that's that's what salvation is. First Timothy chapter one verse eight. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. If you're witnessing to somebody, most of the time you're going to get somebody that says, I'm not that bad. If you were to die tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? I think I'd go to heaven. Why? I'm a good person. That's going to be the majority of what you're going to run into. How do you convict them of sin? How do you bring them to a place of repentance? The law. Now, would it be right to continue in that and say, now... The Ten Commandments says that you've committed these sins here. You've lied, you've stolen, you've, you know, whatever. Now you have to continue in those things in order to be saved. That wouldn't make any sense at all. The law is not for a righteous man. It's for the ungodly and for sinners. To bring them to a point of repentance. To bring them to a point of, I need to be saved. I need to change my mind on this thing of self-righteousness. Okay, look at verse 15. 1 Timothy 1, 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. There's the attitude of somebody who's ready for salvation. If you can't get somebody to admit that they are a sinner, then they can't get saved. Period. Jesus came to save sinners. If you have somebody who's self-righteous, who trusts in their own righteousness, they're not going to get saved. That's just the way it is. And leading them in some kind of a little prayer, just believe and receive, it's giving them a false sense of salvation. That's the worst thing that you can do to them. If they will not admit to being a sinner, then just say, well, you know, you're, you're going to have to stand before the Lord someday. See ya. Don't lead them in any kind of prayer of salvation if they will not admit to being a sinner. That's just really, really bad. Uh, now, one of the things that you'll here which they'll bring up now they'll say well you're saying that you know people have to repent a sinner must repent to be saved well the bible says that god repented so i guess that means that god's a sinner that's one of their little games that they'll play which is ridiculous okay i mean i've heard pretty decent evangelists even using that as an argument now uh genesis chapter 6 verse 6 it's i'll just read two of the verses that they'll go to um, it's Genesis 6, 6 says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the other one, Exodus chapter 32, verse 14 says, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Okay? Now, the term repentance or repented or repent is determined by the context where it appears. Now, either one of those contexts there, does it say anything about God sinning? No. Well, what's the repentance mean? It means a change of mind. He changed his mind. That's all it means. You know, and I mean that that little trick that they play, it just it has no basis. It's, it's ridiculous. The definition of repentance is determined by the context. Okay? God changed his mind about blessing man back before the flood. He changed his mind about that and just letting them do whatever they want. He had to bring an end to their wickedness. The thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. God had to bring an end to that. He had to change his mind. I mean, he told them, hey, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He couldn't do that anymore because they were using it to sin. Okay? He had to change his mind on that. He had no other choice. And in Exodus chapter 32, verse 14, he was going to destroy the Israelites. And Moses, you know, kind of intervened and said, you know, please don't do that. And God changed his mind. He repented of the evil that he was going to do to him. Okay. And as I said, a lost sinner, it's not the same thing. I mean, read the context. You know, that's, that's one of the worst things nowadays. You have people that are just taking verses totally out of context 
and basing whole doctrine on them. I mean, you have to compare Scripture with Scripture. But now what happens, this guy that goes out and he gives candy to little kids and he, and he you know, oh, you're a Christian now, you pray to prayer, you're in. You know, and there's no repentance tied with their salvation. What happens to those types of people? Turn back to Second Peter chapter 2. Just a few more places to look up here this morning. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter 2 verse 20. It says here, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You know, there's a lot of people that are like that. They receive the knowledge. They go to a church somewhere. And I mean, that that one time we ran into a guy, we were out going door to door. We ran into this guy and we said, are, are you saved? And he said, that's what they tell me. <laughs> you know, so what do you mean? Well, that's what the, the pastor at my wife's church, they, they told me I was a Christian. Well, do you know for sure if you die, would you go to heaven? Well, I hope so. I don't, I don't really know. He wasn't saved. The more we talked to him, he didn't know anything about salvation. But they told him he was saved. And see, so you can go and you can play the game in a church somewhere and you can think, you can have the knowledge, but then something happens in the church, you know, the, the pastor has some kind of problem or whatever and the, and the church breaks up and you have these people who are now just totally wicked. A lot of them go and they say, I'm an atheist now. I used to be a Christian, now I'm an atheist. Uh, no, <laughs> I doubt that. But they just go into the world and they end up being worse than if they had never even heard the gospel. I mean, it's it's bad. Aleister Crowley, one of the the, the most infamous Satanists that ever lived in the, in the 19th and 20th century, you know, he died, I, I forget when it was, but, you know, this guy was a bad guy. And his father was a Plymouth Brethren preacher. He's raised in church. Well, he had the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he never got saved. He never repented. And look at what he turned into. It's bad. Now, I don't know all the details of his life, but, you know, bad situation there. And, you know, the fact is that... According to the internet, I just looked up the statistic to get a, a basic figure. According to Wikipedia, which is, you know, recognized by most people as being a big authoritative source, they said that right now, 78.5% of America is professing Christian. Now, do you believe that? Well, I mean, hey, if it's just a prayer that you pray and, and, and that's it, you just believe and receive... You know, see, it's a problem. 78.5% of America is not Christian. <laughs> I can guarantee you. The number's a lot lower than that. And, you know, it's so difficult today because the modern church is so carnal and so wicked, it's hard to tell who's saved anymore. I mean, you get into a conversation with somebody, you know, there again, I remember the one time we were out there at the effort of, there was a craft fair or something, and Marty and I, we were talking, and there was this woman, very, very immodestly dressed, just like, you know, no way. I mean, I almost hate to walk up to this woman, you know. And Marty gave her a tract, and she goes, oh, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. And we're, oh, well, uh, you know, and she goes to some big modern church. But the more you talk to her, yeah, I think she was saved. But her standards? Not very good. I mean, it's it's rough. But there's a lot of people that if you lead them in some kind of a false prayer, I mean, I've known people that they proclaim that they're saved and there's just no fruit at all. I mean, it's you shouldn't be leading people in any kind of prayer of salvation until they come to the knowledge that they are a sinner, until there's repentance there. Because if, if, you, if you lead them in some kind of a prayer, you're going to create this kind of a false convert, just a bad idea. 
Okay, turn back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. We'll read this. It says here, Little children, it is the last time. Is that true of today? <laughs> yeah. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Um, a lot of people use this to falsely teach that the Antichrist is actually a system of belief or something. No, no. Antichrist shall come. That's singular. There will be a man, the man of sin, the son of perdition. He's called by a lot of terms. It's not a system of belief. Okay, that's nonsense. But the point is, Antichrist is mean that it, it does mean that he is against Christ, but it's also a false Christ. Okay, that's what that term means. And there are many false Christs out there. Look at verse 19. They went out from us. They were professing Christians, but they were not of us. Everybody that says that they're a Christian, that doesn't make them a Christian. Okay, you got to watch out for that. Uh, let's continue here. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Okay, you will see that. There are people that do not bear the proper spiritual fruit. Okay, and, and the lines are very blurred right now. Okay, there are people in these big mega churches, I wouldn't step foot in them. And I think a lot of them are lost, but there's probably people in there that are saved. And they're in there because of family relations or whatever. They're carnal. But how can you tell if they're saved? I mean, it, it's just, it's very bad. One more place we're going to turn to, Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. And here's your advice. Okay, this is Paul giving this advice back in the first century, but it's still good today. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, certainly a pastor is given the job of the overseer, but a pastor can't be all places at all times. You know, I do believe in the priesthood of the believer and that we all need to be overseers of the flock. We all need to be concerned for each other. Okay, we all need to be watching out for false prophets and hey if i mean if i say something that's wrong you know rebuke me definitely i mean i'm not above reproach i've been corrected a few times and i've grown from it i appreciate it verse 29 for i know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them of your own selves shall men arise. Okay? Remember back there in, in 1 John chapter 2, it said about basically they went out from us, but they were not of us. Okay? Now, here again, you might have some, you know, there are a lot of uh, sects, cults, I guess you could call them, or whatever, different belief systems within Christianity. I think a lot of Calvinists are saved. Okay? I mean, you'd, you'd have to be pretty messed up as a, you know, maybe a extreme hyper Calvinist or something, maybe, you know, there, but most Calvinists I think are probably saved. Most hyper dispensationalists probably saved. You know, okay. But they will arise and they will speak perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And you have to rebuke those people when they do that. Okay? That's very important. Uh, verse thirty one Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. But verse 32 is the best advice I can give you for today. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. You have to study this book and you have to know this book. Okay, 
if you get away from this Bible, there's no telling what you're going to fall for. I mean, you have to be in this book. And you have to, and you know, as, as I did last Sunday, you're to continue in the things that you have learned and been assured of. And so many people that used to preach Romans Road salvation, that used to preach repentance to salvation, I'm seeing guys that are falling away from that. Why? People that used to be King James Bible believing, falling away. Why? It was good back then. Why isn't it good today? What happened? What changed? People that used to believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. And, you know, they see a, a nut like Harold Camping come out. And, you know, I didn't even know it. But this guy has, I forget what they said, 150 radio stations he's on all across America. I mean, he's reaching millions of people. Now, guess what happens if May 21st, 2011 comes and goes and nothing happens? There's going to be a lot of people that, oh, I can't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture anymore. The rapture is not going to happen. And, you know, he's going to mess up a lot of people. He's a false prophet. And more and more and more false prophets are going to come out as time continues. And they're going to say things purposefully to make the Bible look bad. Now, if you're not continuing in the things... If you're not staying in the book and sticking by the book, you're going to fall for it. Okay? It's just there. Now, just want to say a few things here in closing. When you judge a believer, when you judge somebody, when you meet somebody, you know, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Okay? You are to judge. You're not to believe every spirit. You're to be careful. Okay? Somebody comes up and says, I'm a Christian. You need to be careful. Okay, let me just give you some advice. A false convert usually will be messed up somewhere spiritually. Okay, be very careful about judging a Christian, a professing Christian, according to the flesh. There are Christians that have trouble, that struggle with sin. Okay, you know, you get some guy that's just really a drunk and, and you know, on drugs and whatever, well, you know, it, it looks shaky, but you get, I mean, they could just be a carnal Christian and, and whatever. Be careful about judging according to the flesh. The flesh is not redeemed at salvation. Your old nature is not eradicated. You get away from the Bible, there's no telling what you'll fall for. Okay, but a false convert, it's usually going to appear in the spiritual realm. They're going to say things that are just totally contrary to the Bible. Totally contrary to the Bible. And like I said, the distinctions now are so... I mean, there's people out there that believe all kinds of things. I mean, it's it's just crazy. But one of the worst things that I think is out there today is this thing of easy believism. And if you do any kind of personal work, any kind of soul winning, make sure that you are telling people, getting them to a place where they will admit that they're a sinner. That's so important. Do not get so overzealous and anxious to win souls that you start to compromise. Repentance must be part of it. Repentance is a change in mind, a change in direction, a change in your attitude. That has to be there with salvation. It's in the Bible. Okay? It's just as simple as that. So I guess that's it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.